From Hollywood, it's Out of My Mind. I'm Jay Douglas, and in Episode 8, we're going from the bare essentials to the mysteries of manhood to the dog days of summer, by way of the stars. It's another 17-minute journey into the essential, non-essential, and curiously essential information that baby boomers ask for. If you're not a baby boomer, you can still listen to the show. All you have to do is imagine that you are your parents and ask your friends why the lyrics and music don't rhyme anymore. It's music to our ears as Episode 8 of Out of My Mind begins with a cultural reference gone wrong. Nothing I've done in the two months this show has been on the air has drawn as much attention as my reference to Teddy Bear's Picnic in the opening to Episode 7. About half the people who contacted the show had no idea what I was talking about. Of the other half, most thanked me for reminding them of their late high school or college days when knowing the words to the song could win you a t-shirt or a free beer in that new hot craze, trivia contests. There was a small slice of people who criticized my lack of consideration for mentioning a song that like It's a Small World After All, is impossible to get out of your head. If you're in the first group, let me bring you up to speed with your fellow baby boomers. If you're in the second group, you might want to put on that contest t-shirt. And if you're in the third group, well, I, I can't do any more damage, can I? If you go down in the woods today, you're sure of a big surprise. If you go down in the woods today, you better go in disguise. For every bear that ever there was will gather there for certain because today's the day the teddy bears have their picnic. Teddy bear who's been good is sure of a treat today. There's lots of marvelous things to eat and wonderful games to play. Beneath the trees where nobody sees, they'll hide and seek as long as they please. That's the way the teddy bears have their picnic. Picnic time for teddy bears. The little teddy bears are having a lovely time today. Watch them, catch them unawares, and see them picnic on the holiday. See them gaily get about, they love to play and shout, they never have any cares. At six o'clock their mummies and daddies will take them home to bed, cause they're tired little teddy bears. If you go down in the woods today, you'd better not go alone. It's lovely down in the woods today, but safer to stay at home. For every bear that ever there was, we'll gather there for certain, because today's the day the teddy bears have their picnic. Henry Hall and his orchestra from 1932 with a song for the ages. This particular recording of Teddy Bear's Picnic has a curious relationship with the British Broadcasting Corporation. You can read about it and the history of the song in the show notes. Visit bit.ly slash oomm123, click on episode 8, and follow the link to show notes. At six o'clock, their mummies and daddies will take them home to bed, cause they're tired little teddy bears.
Dogs and cats are not only man's and woman's best friends. They can also be a legitimate treatment when it comes to improving your physical and emotional health, especially for those of us who are out of shape, stressed out, or lonely. But how do you find the right pet for your situation? I asked Kevin McManus, adoption supervisor for the Pasadena Humane Society and SPCA, to help us out with a little guidance for choosing a first, second, or even third pet. Kevin says, much as we might like to deny it, we're not as young as we used to be. And maybe our pets shouldn't be either. Puppies are a slippery slope, and people love puppies, and kittens too. Uh, but just keep in mind that uh, they're, they're a lot more work than, than you may remember. Um, we get so many dogs these days who live to 15, 16, um, that you, know, you might as well take advantage of those really great, calm, easy-walking, fun years where um, you don't have to put up with all of the mess and someone has probably done all the uh, groundwork for you as far as training. If you're adopting a pet for a certain reason, Kevin has some tips on what to do and not to do. Let's start with getting a dog to help keep you on that walking regimen your doctor's been nagging you about. My advice for people in that situation is get out and start walking first. Absolutely, getting a dog will force you to get into a habit of walking, but if you're not giving a dog enough exercise because you're not getting enough exercise, it's really difficult on the pet. And what about the kind of pet to look for when the issue is reducing stress? Almost any pet can reduce stress because they do, you know, the endorphins that they will give you are, are going to be worth their weight in gold. There's one more way pets can make a difference in our lives, and that's when we lose the companionship of a spouse. Kevin says that's when adopting a pet from a shelter may make more sense than buying one from a pet store or breeder. So many pets they really bond, and definitely with shelter pets, um, they really bond with the people who have gotten them out of a shelter. They appreciate it. They treat you like the god or goddess that you are. Whatever your reason, though, Kevin cautions not to adopt a pet in the hopes of duplicating one that's passed away. If you try to duplicate that pet, you're going to be disappointed. Going into, especially an adoption situation, with an open mind and not trying to, you know, replace the pet that you've lost, but replace the, the fill the void that they've left in your life, that's how you should think about it. And as for the notion that adopting from a shelter means bringing a damaged or dangerous pet into your home... They're not damaged goods. They're at a shelter for reasons normally totally beyond their control. Dogs and cats and, and every animal that comes into a shelter, I really do honestly believe that they, they know they're getting a second chance. Their lives have been disrupted. Um, and by taking them into your home, you're giving them a great chance at a new, a new life and you know, hopefully a wonderful ending. Kevin McManus is the adoption supervisor at the Pasadena Humane Society and SPCA in Pasadena, California. He has some suggestions for where to turn if you have questions or concerns about your newly adopted pet. You can listen to his comments in the show notes. When Time Magazine columnist Joel Stein discovered his wife was pregnant with their first child, and it was a boy, he was filled with dread. Well, I never was into boy stuff. I never had a lot of friends who were boys. I don't like cars or trucks. I don't like camping. I don't like, like all the stereotypical male stuff. I wasn't afraid that I was going to have a boy who grew up like me. I was afraid I was going to have a boy who naturally loved that stuff. And he was going to find some other dad, you know, some other dad figure in his life to do that stuff with. To protect his job as a dad figure, Joel schooled himself in the ways of being a man. He earned a Boy Scout camping merit badge. He learned to hunt. He worked a shift as a firefighter. He discovered what it felt like to pass out in front of your buddies during Army basic training. It was a major commitment, both physically and mentally. And this is what it taught him. My time would have been better spent uh, actually learning, you know, how to take care of a baby, which I didn't bother learning. Joel would like to share what else he learned about child rearing. And considering what he went through to gain this insight, I think it only fair we let him. You might even find some wisdom to pass along to the parents of your grandchildren. Number one... Raising a child is informative. When you watch them, you learn what their parents do for a living because they'll be playing with their cars and trucks or whatever, and they'll be like, oh, the police have to get here to this emergency, and the ambulance has to get here, 
and then the reporter needs to get here so we can write about it for the magazine. There's always the one thing the parent does. It's like, oh, the accountant needs to be here to make sure uh, all the paperwork is in order. There's always the one character who shouldn't be there. It's like, oh, that's what your mom or dad does. Number two, now this one is all Joel's. I think I totally misunderstood what fatherhood was. It would have been more important to focus on making tiny pancakes. Like all those books about what to expect when you're expecting, the dad equivalent should mostly be about making tiny pancakes. Like that's the most important thing in being a dad, for sure. Kids love tiny pancakes. And you're the one who's going to do it. Joel Stein is a columnist for Time magazine, an occasional father figure for his son, and no threat to Dr. Spock. He documented his quest to become more manly in his book, Man Made. I've put a link to it in the show notes. Just as our ancestors invested in knowledge on which we depend, we have a responsibility to invest for our descendants. That's Dr. Ed Krupp, director of the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. In Episode 7, Dr. Krupp reminded us that the scientific exploration we do today is an investment, not something with an immediate payback. It's also interest on the debt we owe to visionaries such as Galileo, Kepler, and Newton, who discovered the fundamentals of science that we rely on today. What I was curious about, though, was whether there would be enough people to service that debt, Scientific discovery no longer seems to generate the excitement and enthusiasm it did in the 60s and 70s. I'm, I'm not sure that the enthusiasm for science really has gone away. It takes a different form, perhaps, than, than I recall when, when I was growing up. And there was a tremendous interest in space exploration, largely precipitated by the Cold War and, and the, uh, the uh, tensions between uh, the Soviet Union and the U.S. And that led to competition in space that also had very practical and, and certainly, uh, to a degree, terrifying uh, potential. But that satellite going up, Sputnik 1, really did have a, a, a mobilizing effect on the imaginations for many people. Now, maybe not everybody is, is moving into the notion of exploring the solar system, but we don't need everybody to do that. We just need enough people to do that, just like we need just enough to build bridges and just enough to design electronic components. Uh, and then you say, well, is, is the spirit of the times still exciting and still mobilized? Well, frankly, I, you know, I look superficially at the news and, you, you know, pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope, or Pluto for that matter, command headlines still. They, they take the top half of, of, of the, the, the page, whether it's on a, a computer screen or a conventional newspaper. Astronomy is always up there, way out of proportion to uh, the, the, you know, the number of people that participate in it directly or what it actually does for anybody individually. But because it acts on the imagination, of everybody, or at least a lot of people, uh, it, it, it resonates with, with the spirit and makes us think about things that are much grander than we otherwise would. If we're going to maintain that enthusiasm, though, we need to replace the motivation of the space race with something else. And that's where all of us can play a role. We have at our disposal the resources to create enthusiasm and curiosity in our children and grandchildren. Well, of course, in this age, Griffith Observatory has a website, but better than that, Griffith Observatory does at a distance what it does locally. So if you're somewhere else in the country and you're trying to encourage kids to get involved with astronomy and the universe and life and everything, uh, of course, Griffith Observatory is still a resource. And in fact, when there's a lunar eclipse or a transit of Venus or something, we, we put that on a uh, live streaming. But that's no substitute for what what you're doing closer to home. And most people, most places are somewhat near a, a metropolitan environment where there is bound to be some institution that has something going on like this, a planetarium, maybe a public observatory, certainly the major cities do. And even on a smaller scale, Many places throughout the country have groups of amateur astronomers, and those amateurs are not only interested in their own viewing of the sky, most of those groups actually set up nights for, uh, just as they do here, uh, for free telescope viewing. They, they want people to have a chance to look at the cosmos directly. And so amateur groups that are in someone's neighborhood is one place to check. Obviously, the first search is, is on the web. Uh, 
a, an institution similar to Griffith Observatory, whether it's a planetarium or a museum or uh, a small observatory, you're bound to find them in, in a lot of places. And, you know, if, if that's in itself is still not enough, uh, heck, you just do what I did. You put a book in front of them. And I know that's a very archaic concept, but in fact, books enliven the story because books have images and you can supplement those dramatically of course with what we now do uh, on the web or in a, in a co computer and so it's easy to access the universe i mean we we make it possible here but lots of other people do too best of all it's easy to get the process started i think the most satisfying experience of all is simply looking at the sky yourself dr ed krupp is the director of the griffith observatory in los angeles if you're visiting Southern California, it's a place that belongs on your must-see list. I've put a link to the observatory's website in the show notes, so you can see everything the observatory has to offer, along with instructions for getting there. Dr. Krupp told me a lively and captivating story about Griffith J. Griffith, and why he established the observatory, which, by the way, must offer free admission under the terms of his will. You can listen to the tale in the show notes. That's going to bring to a close Star Studied Episode 8 of Out of My Mind. Thank you if you were one of the people who shared your thoughts about Teddy Bear's Picnic. You make the show what it is. Remember, you can always reach us by going to bit.ly slash oomm123 and clicking on Episode 8. There you'll find several ways to make comments and ask questions. You'll also find ways to help us grow the audience, such as by liking our Facebook page, leaving a great review on iTunes, and above all, urging your friends to listen and subscribe to the show. I'll have a new episode for you next Saturday at 8 a.m. Eastern. Let's talk then. I'm Jay Douglas. Out of My Mind is produced by Penny Summers and is a production of the Theater of Your Mind Incorporated, Hollywood, California. <laughs>